All right, good morning. So I think we are getting into the normal pace uh, of this class after uh, the turmoil of the snow in the beginning. I want it back. If there is something that uh, you like to be done in a different way, something that is missing, something that is useless, a good time uh, to make the point. Don't be shy. I will not hold it against you, rather the opposite. If you contribute to have this uh, more effective or more fun, you know, more fun you should say that I, I should say better jokes. I have the one I have. <laughs> Say that again. I don't see how your jokes could be improved. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> hey. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, when, you, when you say like the formulas, yes. you, when you like, go through them, like, really don't see it then, Yes. So you just wait like a few seconds for us to write it down? Yes, I will. And Fantastic. And uh, if I don't, uh, you say, slow down, stop, uh, let me write the formula, and it uh, will be fantastic. Right. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Anything else? All right. So, we have been talking about functions. We finished this one. I want to go over the more technical parts to make sure that you get them. Make a couple of examples, and I'd be delighted to take questions. So, first, what is a function? A function is a correspondence between the element of a set that we call domain and the element of another set that we call codomain. It's a correspondence with one crucial property that for each element of the domain, there is exactly one that corresponds to it, according to this function. All right? Domain, codomain, the correspondence with this property. For each element of the domain, there is exactly one of the codomain that corresponds to it. This is the first uh, point I wanted to make. The second uh, is a property of function that we call Injection or injectivity or one to one. This property says look, if you have two inputs and they will give you the same output, they correspond to the same element. These two inputs actually were the same, they are not really good. It's the same. Alright? We can do the contrapositive. The contrapositive is that if you have two elements that are different, then their outputs will be different. The only way for two elements to have the same corresponding is to be the same. All right? Now I'm going to make examples of all this. And then the other property, bijection, bijectivity, uh, sorry, surjectivity. Take it back. Surjectivity. When is a function subjective? Every time you pick an element of the codomain, you can find one of the domains that, that corresponds to it. There is at least one. There may be a million, but there is at least one. Is it again? Yes. So, should we make an example for this problem? So I take uh, these functions uh, from the integers just because it's easy. So the first function, I call it the D, from the integers uh, to the integer, D of x uh, is equal to x. Should we make an example to Make sure that we understand it. Uh, zero goes to where? 
7 goes to 14. Negative 2 goes to negative 4. Fantastic. You got it. So, is this a function? Yes. If you pick an x in z, there is only one element in z that is 2x. A number has only one double. There are no two different doubles of the same number. So, this is a function. Is injective and is subjective. How do we argue or determine whether it is injective? Say what? Well, let's say two elements. We don't know whether they are the same or they are different. Suppose that these two elements uh, correspond to the same. What can we say about uh, those two elements? So here I have x and y. I don't know if they are the same or different. x uh, goes to 2x and y goes to 2y. Now I say, suppose that these two are equal. Is x equal y or no? Of course. And so, what do we conclude? Yes, we conclude that x is y, and so what's the property of this function? Inject. Very good. So, we determine this one from knowing this one. We conclude this one and we say that the function is uh, injective. This is the first example. Now we make the second example. I'm sorry? All right, so we can also check whether this is subjective or not while we are here. All right. So since you asked, not, I want to put you on the spot. First, uh, let's uh, recall what does it mean subjective. Subjective means that the we pick uh, an element uh, in the codomain, uh, Z, and uh, we need to find uh, an element uh, in the domain uh, that corresponds or maps to that. So for example, if I pick 14, do I find an element that uh, maps to that? Yes, 7. Can we do this for every element or there are elements that we can? So, if I pick 13, what is the element that goes to 13? No, we can find it because 13 is not a double of any integer, right? And so, what do we conclude? We pick 13, here we say no, and so we say not surjective. All right? So now let's take this function. I call it H. H goes from Z to Z, and I say that H of X is the floor of X divided by 2. All right, then. So this is floor. Why do I take the floor? Because if I divide it by 2, I may not find the element in Z. So I want this to be a function. So let's see whether we understand it. If I take a 7, what do I find on the other side? Very good. And uh, if I take a 4, what do I find on the other side? 2. And if I take a negative 2, what do I find on the other side? Fantastic. You got it. So now I want to know whether this is injective and this is subjective. Let's say one more time, injective. I take two elements x and y, and it turns out that here I have uh, x half uh, floor, y half uh, floor. Suppose uh, that they are equal. What can I say about x and y? X and y are equal. So if x and y are equal, of course, when I go there, 
they are equal. Do they have to be equal? Are they always equal? No. Who can make an example where the result is the same but they are not equal? Yes? Six and seven. Six and seven. So let's look at six and seven. Six and what is going to give me? Three. Three. Do we want to say why three? We divide six by two. That is three. And then we take the floor. And the floor of three is three. Seven. The result is three as well. All right? Why? Because we divide it by two, which is three and a half, and when we take the floor, it's three again. So here we have that they are equal, and here we determine that they may not be equal. Of course, if x and y are equal, when you do the computation, you get equal. But they don't have necessarily to be equal. So what do we conclude? It's not, not injective. Fantastic. Not uh, injective. What about subjective? Subjective means that uh, if you take an element in the codomain, you find one of the domains that goes there. Right? Uh, so, if I take a 3, what do I find? 7, right? I find it. If I take 2, Four. Can you find an element that uh, when you divide it by two and uh, take the floor, you cannot uh, get there? No. So, if I take x, uh, what is the element uh, that goes there? If here I have x, which element, uh, when I map it, uh, goes to x? 2x. Why floor? Two x. You do the floor, it doesn't hurt. But. So, if I want to get an x in the codomain, I start from two x, I compute the function, and I get x. So, I always find an element that goes there. And so, this function is uh, surjective. Here we saw a function that is injective but not subjective, and one that is subjective but not injective. Now, you can have functions that are neither and functions that are both. What if I give you one that is neither and one that is both, uh, and you do what I did uh, so you can test whether you understand this or not? So, let's take this function, f from z to z, and f of x is equal x plus 19. All right, you should have done it by now. All right, so this one is injective, and this one is subjective. If someone is in doubt, uh, there is no shame, uh, but I would like uh, 
you to tell me why you are in doubt or what you were not able to see, so I can fix it. Someone wants to tell me? Say it again. This is bijective because it's both, of course. All right. So let's uh, take this function. This, of course, uh, is going to be neither because it's the last case uh, I'm discussing. And so you should be able to tell me why it's neither. Not that it's neither. I'll tell you already. So this is still the same. f of x uh, is uh, the rightmost digit uh, of uh, the decimal representation of x. So, suppose that x is 32. When I write 32, this is the representation, decimal representation, right? So, what is the rightmost digit? Two, the other right. <coughs> All right, so let's see whether we understand it. 32 goes to where? 2. Negative 127 goes to? 7. Seven. You got it. So, is this injective? No. no. Who can tell me very sharply why not? This is not as sharp as I want. Fantastic. I love it. Who said it? Yes. 32 and 42 are different but they go both to 2. So the output is the same, but input wasn't the same. All right. Every time you have to disprove something, don't make it general. The opposite. Make it as particular as possible. Because then it's very easy to see. You don't have to reason too much, right? Someone says, so 32 and 42, everyone sees that they both go to 2 and they are different. It's done. Is this subjective? No. Who can give me a compelling someone else? Yes. All right, you didn't get my point. You should say, look, you cannot get 11. Not the two digits, because then I have two reasons. But 11 is so much to see. All right? You get the point? Fantastic. All right. Anything more about this? I never, ever, ever going to talk about this again. <laughs> Actually, if any time you have a doubt about this, uh, I'll be very happy to talk about it. All right. Functions. Relations. What is a relation? A relation also, oops, you are not seeing it. A relation also is a correspondence. We typically don't say domain and codomain. Also because sometimes in a relation, you don't have domain and codomain. You may have only one set, or you may have three or four or five. And so we take tuples, depending on how many sets we have, eh? and we consider pairs. And we don't put any restriction. We can put in the relation any pair we want. All of them, none, or any way in between. All right? When we have only two sets, and we re can represent it in a way similar to a function, and this is good because it helps us understand uh, better a function and a relation. We can look at this as pair, where the first slot is in x and the second slot is in y. And in this case, you will have the pair 1d, 2b, and 2c. And this is the relation. All right? We look at the four properties, the technical properties, of a relation. And I want to spend again a little bit of time on this. 
to make sure that everyone understands it. So the first property is reflexive. We discuss uh, this property for binary relations on one set. What does it mean a binary on one set? That we have a pair, two slots, and both slots uh, are elements in that set. There is only one set, and both slots are filled with an element in one set. All right? So reflex. For each element of the set, uh, x, x, x is in the relation. All right? Should we make an example and see this property on the example? Let's take a relation that everyone knows about. Eh? And I say that R is the set of X, Y. R is a subset of uh, natural cross natural. So this is a binary relation on the natural. Every element of the pair is a natural. The natural are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And I say X and Y are the relation when X is less than Y. This is a very familiar relation. Of course, so this is not a function, right? Eh? Because if x is equal to, y can be 5 or 7 or 19, they are all in the relation. So it's not a function. Alright. So reflexive means eh, that the pair xx is in this relation. Is this a relation reflexive? No. Why not? A compelling example. Fantastic, you got it. One is not a less than one. So one, one is not in the relation, so it's not a reflex. Very good. Symmetry. Symmetric says if X and Y are in the relation, then Y and X are in the relation. Alright? So is this symmetric? No. Companion example. Y is 22. I'm sorry? X can be 2 and Y can be 5, but X yes. can be 5 and Y can be 22. Fantastic. So, 2 is related to 5, but 5 is not related to 2. This is just one example. It's enough to disqualify it from being symmetric. Transitive. Is this transitive? Yes. Yes. Why? One is less than two, two is less than three, so one is less than three. So this is very good, that this is an example. Right, then. To disqualify an example is enough. To prove it, there has to be for all. Right, then. If we look at that, the formula says, for all x, y, and z. If x is less than y, and y is less than z, then x is less than z. We know that this is true, right? Yes. So I'm not going to prove it, but we know that this is true. And so this is trans. All right? Final property, anti-symmetric. If uh, by any chance uh, x is related to y and uh, y is related to x, then x and y must be the same. This is the only way that uh, they can be related uh, both ways. Is this anti-symmetric? Yes. Yes. Oh, it's good because here I have here yes and no. Go ahead. One is less than one, so one is less than one. Like it, anti-symmetric. Anti-symmetric means uh, suppose that the x is less than two, oh. and two is less than one. Can we conclude that one is equal to two? Fantastic, fantastic. So this is the situation where you never ate uh, your hamburger. So you don't have to pay, right? So because it never happens that x is less than y and y is less than x, you don't have to show anything. 
right? So is it anti-symmetric? Yes, it is anti-symmetric. So should I say one more time why it's anti-symmetric? So to be anti-symmetric, it has to verify that problem. And this relation indeed verifies that property. The property says, look, if you pick X and Y, any way you want, you are the architect. If you pick X and Y, and X is less than Y, and Y is less than X, then something has to happen, right? So now, because never X is less than Y, and Y is less than X, we don't care what has to happen. Because you are never in the position to have to show. You never ate the hamburger, so you don't have to pay. There is nothing to pay here, so you are free. Yes, first, uh, you are second. Yes? Um, so there are lots of could be lots of relations that are neither symmetric or anti symmetric. Yes, uh, there are relations that are neither symmetric nor anti symmetric. No. More interesting, you can have a relation which is symmetric and anti-symmetric. Yes? Uh, so another way to say it is so that you can't find... Yes, you are there. If you can find x less than y and y less than x, you are free. the key properties uh, that I wanted to review. Now, now we discuss uh, some uh, classes uh, of uh, relations. Not one particular relation, but a bunch uh, of relations. And the first one is a class uh, that we call a partial order. We care very much about uh, ordering things, uh, sorting things. Why do we care, particularly as computer scientists, but also as people? Right, to find the things. This is the crucial point. So, nowadays, uh, the telephone book uh, doesn't exist anymore. But if you go back only five or ten years, uh, you would get uh, a telephone book delivered to you, right? Uh, and the telephone book for Portland had how many entries? a few hundred thousand, right? So if they are sorted, if they are sorted, how long does it take to find someone there? A minute? If they are not sorted, how long it takes to find someone there? Rather than going on the phone, you can walk there, probably it's faster, right? And so this is why we care about the ordering things, sort of. And so one of these relations is uh, a partial order. And so now we discuss uh, what is this relation, and this is some example. Some are very natural, and some will be very unnatural. Very surprising. So first, uh, when a relation, we, when do we call it a partial order? If it has three properties, reflexive, transitive, and anti-symmetric. All right? Now, just to make it, this is very simple. If it has these three properties, we say this relation is a partial order. To make it a little bit more difficult, some people don't want a reflexive. Actually, we want something that is called irreflexive, that we are not discussing here, which says that xx is not in the relation for every x, which is the opposite, somewhat. Some other people don't care. Maybe it's reflexive, maybe it's reflexive, maybe it's neither. So, if you look some textbook, particularly if you go on Wikipedia, you will not find that they are reflexive. And actually, when we are going to discuss this, uh, once in a while we'll take reflexive out and it's still in order. So, don't be too offended. The convention is that if I ask you what is a partial order, 
we put a bare reflex. So a partial order, we denote it uh, with either of these two symbols, either this one or this one. The first one is very familiar with numbers. But now we are going to apply this to things which are very different from numbers. So if you are offended that you have that symbol and you use it for something which is completely different, then you can use the other one. You see the difference, right? Instead of having a straight lines, they are curved. And so let's look at a few examples. Z with the less than or equal to is a partial order. We say is a po set for partially ordered set. And so we say that this thing here is a po set. There is a set and there is a partial order. Do you see that the less than or equal to is uh, reflexive, transitive, and anti-symmetric? Reflexive is obvious because uh, x is less than or equal to x. It's just equal to x. Transitive, people were very happy with the transitive about the lesser than. This is transitive as well, the same way. Why is anti-symmetric? Because if x is less than or equal to y, and y is less than or equal to x, uh, the only way you make this work is when they are equal. All right, so this is a partial form. No surprises. The next one that takes uh, the integer positive. And so these are 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And that the symbol is divided. When A divides B, when there is a sum T that if you multiply A times T, you get B. Could you make an example? Why 2 divides A? Right, because there is 4, and you multiply 2 by 4, and you get A. Why 5 divides 10? Because there is 2. 5 times 2 will give you 10. Alright? So this one is a partial order. Look bizarre? Well, what do we want? When do we say that a relation is a partial order? It's written there. Reflexive, transitive, and anti-symmetric. Should we look at this uh, for this uh, relation? So, we have to show that it's symmetric. How do we show that the divide is symmetric? Sorry. I said symmetric, but I wanted to say reflexive. Why divide is reflexive? Because for every x positive integer, x divides x. Why x divides x? Because x times 1 is x. So, it's very easy to see that it is a reflexive. Why is transitive? Well, suppose that you have x divide y. Should I make an example? 2 divides uh, 10. And then I have uh, y divides uh, z. So, 10 uh, divides uh, 50. Right? Does 2 divide 50? Yes. Should I prove it uh, or is uh... so? It's reflexive x when x divides x 
X is obviously divides X. But if it's 2 and 10, then how is that reflexive? No, reflexive means that the if it's every number divides itself. Okay. If you take the two different numbers, uh, we don't care when we are talking about reflexive. We care for something else, but not for reflexive. For reflexive means, look, every number has to divide itself, which is obvious. So it's reflexive. Should we write, uh, maybe I should have done it, or maybe you should have asked it, should we write a few pairs that are in derivation to make sure that we understand it? Who wants to tell me a few pairs that are in derivation? 7, 7? Yeah? 2, 4? Yes. 9, 27? Yeah. Who want to tell me a pair that is not a there? Say that again? 3, 5. 3, 6. 3 divides 6. 3, 5 is not a there. Another one that is not a there? 11, 2. Because 11 doesn't divide 2. Right? All right. And so... If 2 divides 10 and 10 divides 50, then 2 divides 50. This is true for every number, not 2, 10, and 50. Yes? And this was only mapping to Z, not to R. Right. This is only the positive. So it's not even Z. It's 1, 2, 3, 4. Yes. So now we have to show that this is anti symmetric. Antisymmetric. What does it mean, antisymmetric? If x divides y and y divides x, then they have to be the same. Right? Is this obvious enough? So, x divides so. Suppose that x divides y. What do we know? That y is equal x times some k. Yes? Then y divides x. What do we know? That x is equal to y sum uh, k prime. Right? And so, if, you, if we substitute what we ha have, uh, y is equal to y times k times k prime. Yeah? And so, k times k prime is what? Uh, has to be 1. And so, x equal... Sorry, y equal x times 1, x is equal to y. Yes? I'm sorry, I don't hear. Let me pick the notes. We say reflexive, transitive, and anti symmetric. I'm sorry? All right. No problem. I welcome any question. All right. Then. So, last example. Last example is that you have a set A. A set A. And you consider... Two to the A with the operation inclusion. You remember what is uh, this uh, two to the A? Power set. Very good. Should we make an example? Maybe maybe I should go back for a second here. Maybe I should go back uh, and show you something that in a sense is obvious. But the first time you look at this is not so obvious. When we consider this, uh, we said, uh, look, uh, 3 and 5 uh, are not uh, in this relation, right? So here we have 
have an order and we cannot say 5 and 3 are not in this relation either, right? So we have an order, but we don't know whether 3 comes before 5, it doesn't, or 5 comes before 3, it doesn't. So this is why we call it a partial order. Because we can pick two elements and we cannot say which one comes first. Neither comes before the other. And this is why we call it partial. If uh, given two elements, you can only say which one comes first, then we call this order total or linear. You can put all the elements one after the other, the first, the second, the third, and so on. But in this case, uh, we can. Does it offend you? Just a little. Right, then. Uh, Neorotic, but not too much. This is why we call it the part of order. And now you say, what do I do with that? And we are going to do a lot of stuff with this. Uh, because this really models uh, a lot of uh, practical situations. Suppose that you have to make a cake. You like cooking? So you have to make a cake. And you take a recipe. And in the recipe there are uh, various steps. One of which is that you make the crust, uh, so you put the sugar and flour and whatever you put in the crust. And then you bake it. You can also make uh, some cream. Eh? If we add it, you beat it, then you make this cream. Then when the cake uh, is baked, it's cooled down, you put it on the table and you put uh, the cream on top. Now, you can make the cream uh, before baking the cake, making the uh, crust uh, and baking. Or you can do the opposite. You can make the crust and make it, eh, and then uh, do the cream. What is important uh, is that uh, you put uh, the cream after you bake it. Because if you put the cream and you bake it, uh, it's a mess. It's a disaster. Right? So really, in real life, uh, when you make the things, eh, it's not that you have to make them one after another after another. There are some that you have to make before. But others, uh, that it doesn't matter. This is true when you build a car. When you build a car, someone makes uh, the electrical system. Someone makes the engine. Until you put uh, them together, you can make one before the other, or vice versa. But when you make the engine, you have to do steps in a certain way. right? You cannot uh, put uh, the piston inside the... Uh, the engine and then put uh, the ring. That's too late. First you have to put the ring. And then you have to put the piston inside. You with me? All right. So now let me go back uh, to the example I was making before. This is another example of a poset. Partially order set. A poset, uh, when we present it, there are those two pieces. There is the set. And then uh, there is the binary relation on the set. All right. So, just to recall. Suppose that A is the set uh, small a, b, and c. Right? Who can tell me some elements uh, that are uh, in the power set? Say that again. Empty set. Empty set, uh, thank you. Another one? Just a couple. The set uh, with only the element A, the set with only the element B, and at the end uh, you will have the set of A, B, and C. All right? If you want to write all of them, and you want to make sure you don't lose any, how many elements there will be there? Eight. Very good. Is everyone happy with eight, or you want to know how eight comes about? There are three elements uh, in the set, so there are two to the third uh, elements in the power set. All right, and so now we compare these elements here with this operation, inclusion. So what do we say? We say that empty comes uh, before A, because it's contained. 
we can say that A, which is an element of the power set, comes before A, B, C, because uh, this is contained in this one. When it comes to A and B, these are incomparable. You cannot say that A comes before B because it's not included. You cannot say that A includes B because it's not included. And so, neither comes before the other. So far so good? All right. There is a cute representation of these things which is called a Hass diagram. And this is the representation. This is also useful for reasoning about. Eh? And at some point, eh, we will learn an algorithm about this stuff. And eh, we will use uh, this diagram. So this diagram is made in this way. At the bottom, you put the, all the elements and then no one comes before them. So these are all the smallest elements in the set. In this example, what we put here? N, the only one, right? Then at uh, the next level, we put all the elements uh, which are a little bit bigger than this one, as little as possible. So you cannot put anyone in between. So here we put A, Y, because A, comes after N. But you don't find anyone which is between N and A. In technical term, A is the immediate successor of N. It's the one that comes just after it, and you cannot find anyone in between. Immediate. And so here we put the A, B, and C. Yeah? The next level you do the same. You put all the ones that are bigger than this one and you put a line if uh, they are indeed big, uh, bigger. So A comes uh, before AB, right? So there is a line. A comes uh, before AC because it's contained. There is no line between A and BC. Why there is no line between A and BC? Right, because A doesn't come uh, before. All right? And so, you do this until you are done. If you go on Wikipedia and you look at the Haas diagram, there are some which are beautiful. Piece of art. Some people like it. Some people get a little less excited about it. So that's fine as well. All right, this is a good representation. If you want to know whether this uh, is greater than uh, this one, what do you do? You move up the lines because this relation is transitive. Uh, this comes before this one. This uh, comes before this one. So by transitivity, this comes before that. All right? And so another example is that you take the first uh, then the numbers with the relation of divide. So one divides two, three, five, and seven. Why one doesn't divide six? Right, because it's not immediate. Right, uh, we said it's an immediate successor. Means it comes after, indeed, uh, one divides the six. But we can find the three in between because one divides three and three divides six. <coughs> and so that is the Hass diagram for the other relation. Yes? Because A doesn't come before B and C. In order to come before B and C, this is the relation that we have to look at. You see it here by the arrow? And this is containment. So A would come before B and C if the set containing A 
were contained in the center of this, but it doesn't. Very good, very good question. When you have a doubt like this, you just ask it and we solve it. Yes? Really the line between each uh, set is the operation of the Kind of. We put a line there if uh, there is the relation. If the relation is true. Yes, sir. Okay. And there is no one in between. Very good. All right? So did I beat you enough in this uh, R1 and in the break? All right, 10 minutes.